five cases of unidentified remains in New England that you may be able to help with. Step back nearly 90 years into the haunting tapestry of a chilling, unsolved mystery. A mother and her two children, brutally murdered, their bodies left on the desolate side of a forgotten road, and their identities still shrouded in darkness. It's a tale that has lingered through the decades, waiting to be solved. Though time has veiled the truth, we're delving into the depths of a bygone era, where the echoes of a gruesome crime continue to resonate. In the quiet hills of East Middlebury, Vermont, on May 15, 1935, a woman picking flowers stumbled upon a skull, triggering a cascade of events that would unfold into one of the oldest unsolved mysteries in the state. The bodies of a woman and two children lay on the side of the Middlebury Bristol Road, wrapped in an unexpected shroud, an awning. This makeshift burial ground, concealed in a space merely eight square feet, harbors secrets that have eluded an answer for almost a century. As the investigation progressed, the gruesome details unfolded. The victims, a mother, and her two children, had been shot in the head, their remains left in a seemingly careless arrangement. No houses in sight on a road seldom traveled except by loggers, recently identified as current-day Burnham Road. The sheriff of 1935 believed the bodies were brought to this secluded spot, their lives extinguished elsewhere over a year and a half prior, somewhere between 1932 and 1934. The mysterious circumstances only deepened as weeks passed, drawing in curious onlookers. A 13-year-old girl exploring the grim site stumbled upon a dress snap, a clue that would later connect to the mother's clothing. This discovery turned out to be pearl buttons, akin to those found on pajamas of the time, and hinted at a story woven with threads of familial tragedy. Also found were more clues, a decayed blanket, possibly an army or horse blanket, eyelets from duffel bags, a piece of green canvas, and a piece of silk fabric, a revolver bullet, possibly from an army-issued firearm at the time raised questions that echoed beyond Vermont's borders. The canvas awning, a pivotal piece in this enigma, led investigators on a quest to trace its origin. Was it hastily cut from a summer residence, a store, or even a filling station? The awning still had four-wheel pulleys attached and ropes cut that appeared to have been tied to a structure. Metzger brothers of Rutland and James Wakefield sons of Burlington were called in to provide fragments of insight, confirming the material's identity, but leaving the manufacturer's identity unknown. The canvas, estimated at 20 feet square, appeared to have its roots outside the state of Vermont, amplifying the mystery. Lake Champlain became a focal point in the search for answers as the police explored missing persons reports from the region. A theory emerged. Were the victims summer residents or adventurers on an outing, their fates sealed not far from the haunting site? The woman, aged 35 to 45, and her children, a 13 to 15-year-old teenager and a 9 to 11-year-old child, were found with two bullet holes in each head, a cruel signature of their unknown assailant. Older articles suggest the remains found were of two women and a man, so it's possible the family is a mother and her son and daughter. Dental work emerged as a clue. With gold fillings in the woman's teeth and a brace on the child crafted by the SS White Company, headquartered in Boston. A dental brace, so distinct that officials believed its origins could be traced. The brace was put in dental magazines, soil samples were analyzed, Missing persons scrutinized, and the skulls brought to Boston for analysis, yet the trio's identities remained elusive. Diving into these old articles, one gets the sense this was an affluent family based on a possible summer residence, pearl and silk clothing, and gold fillings. Now, almost a century later, as this unsolved mystery lingers like a ghost from the past, a plea echoes through time. 
Does your family harbor an ancient tale of vanished kin? Have you heard whispers of a long-forgotten murder? If the recesses of your family history hide a connection, contact the Middlebury Police Department and help bring closure to the oldest unidentified remains in Vermont's history. The fifth oldest in the United States. Today we are going to be discussing the discovery of male remains found in Rhode Island back in 1987 that to this day remain unidentified in the hopes that someone can help with his identification in getting his name back and to help with solving his murder. On June 18, 1987, the remains of a man were found deceased in Stump Pond in Smithfield, Rhode Island. Stump Pond is part of the Stillwater Reservoir and is located in the northern part of the state. The victim suffered multiple stab wounds. He was found fully clothed and wrapped in chicken wire. The body was also weighed down, but the details of how he was weighed down have not been disclosed. He was estimated to be deceased for about two weeks. His description was that of a white male, who was estimated to be between 25 to 35 years old. He was 5 feet, 5 inches tall, and was 122 pounds. He had brown hair, brown eyes, and had a mustache. A sketch was done by law enforcement to help aid in identification. His body was found wearing a black sleeveless midriff muscle shirt with the words San Juan printed horizontally and vertically on the back of the shirt in white lettering. He was also wearing gray sweatpants, which were size extra small, along with blue undershorts. He had on size seven and a half sneakers with the brand name of McGregor Trister. He did not have on any socks. This unidentified homicide victim was entered into Name Us, which stands for the National Missing and Unidentified Person System on May 20, 2014. This case is being handled by the Smithfield Police Department. If you have any information on his identity or any information on the details of his murder, please contact the Smithfield Police Department. In the chill of a February morning, amidst the tranquil flow of the Monot, a Quat River, a routine kayaking session morphed into a chilling discovery that would perplex authorities and grip the community of Braintree, Massachusetts. It was February 15, 1997, and as the clock ticked towards 8.54 a.m., a local man navigating the river for his customary morning exercise stumbled upon a scene straight out of a nightmare. There, lying partially submerged in the unforgiving embrace of the river's brush, lay the lifeless form of a partially frozen woman, her presence a stark contrast against the serene backdrop of nature. The kayaker, accustomed to the familiar sights along the river, was shaken to his core by this unexpected encounter. Police, forced to hack their way through the dense underbrush, uncovered a puzzling mystery that defied easy explanation. The woman, shrouded in death's mystery, offered scant clues to her identity or the circumstances leading to her demise. With only a small trickle of blood staining her lips and her clenched hand grasping a tree branch, her silent testimony raised more questions than answers. While no evidence suggested foul play, was it possible she met with a sinister demise or had tragedy struck by cruel accident? How had she ventured into a secluded stretch of the river, far from the beaten path? Or did she go into the river further upstream? And why, in her final moments, did she cling desperately to that solitary branch? As investigators delved deeper into the mystery, the pieces of the puzzle refused to fall neatly into place. A sketch released by the authorities a few days after the discovery depicted a woman of Asian descent, her features etched with an air of melancholy that mirrored the unanswered questions surrounding her untimely demise. Standing 4 feet 11 inches tall, weighing 88 pounds, with very short black hair, only measured a half inch in length and black eyes, her physical stature belied the weight of the secrets she carried to her watery grave. 
An extra tooth on the right side of her mouth also provides more mystery and clues. The medical examiner estimated that she was between 25 to 35 years old, and she carried one more secret. She was eight to 10 weeks pregnant. Stranger still were the handwritten labels found within her clothing, bearing the name Maria Marin. Was it a clue left behind by the woman herself? Was this actually her name? or a cryptic message waiting to be deciphered? Or did it hint at a connection to another, a person lurking just beyond the reach of law enforcement's grasp? She was found wearing a rust-colored ski jacket, green and gray striped shirt, black stretch pants, and white sneakers and black socks. No other items or identifying factors were found with the remains. With no missing persons report matching her description, the search for answers stretched far and wide, spanning borders and eliciting leads from distant corners of the continent. Yet, as the days turned into weeks and the weeks into months, the mystery remained shrouded in silence, a riddle echoing through the corridors of time. Today, more than two decades later, the memory of that fateful February morning lingers like a ghost along the banks of the river a reminder of a life lost and a mystery unsolved. To this day, the Massachusetts State Police continue to seek closure, urging anyone with information to come forward and bring an end to the mystery of the identity of this woman who deserves to be identified. Deep within the serene woods bordering Bear Brook State Park in Allenstown, New Hampshire, lies a haunting enigma that has plagued investigators for decades, a haunting tale that begs for closure and resolution. It all began on a fateful day, May 9th, 2000, when the spine-chilling uncovering of skeletal remains concealed within overturned metal barrels rocked the tranquility of the surroundings Inside lay the silent remnants of two young girls, their story echoing with tragedy and unspeakable horror. This eerie discovery echoed a grim pattern from 1985, where another metal barrel yielded the remains of a woman and a young girl, both victims of brutal blunt force trauma, a pattern veiled in darkness, leaving the identities of these lost souls obscured. Despite the relentless passage of years, investigators refused to let the memory of these unknown victims fade into obscurity. Amidst this grim tableau emerged a name that sent shivers down spines. Terry Peter Rasmussen, a man enveloped in aliases. A serial killer whose gruesome legacy spanned states. A web of violence ensnaring at least six lives, weaving a tapestry of deceit that traversed decades. Forensic science offered a glimmer of hope, identifying the woman and two of the young girls as Marley's Honeykirch and her daughters, Marie Vaughn and Sarah McWaters. Forensic science also forged a DNA link between the last remaining unidentified child found in 2000 and Rasmussen. She was in fact the daughter of the infamous killer, a mere toddler at the time of her demise her presence hauntingly entwined with the lives of the other three victims. Their connection to Rasmussen began with Marlise's last sighting in La Puente, California, on Thanksgiving Day before disappearing with Rasmussen and her daughters, never to be seen again. The mysterious child was described as being three feet, 10 inches tall, with fine, brown, slightly wavy hair, and a noticeable overbite. Authorities believe she was between two to four years old. Yet, her origin story eluded investigators, hinting at a childhood spent in northern inland regions, northern New Hampshire, Vermont, or perhaps even farther inland, a poignant clue yearning to be pieced together. It remains unclear how she was associated with Marley's and her daughters, or who her mother was but it is estimated that they all died at the same time between 1978 and 1984. Rasmussen's life was a dark labyrinth, a tumultuous narrative spanning from Colorado to California, a life marked by abuse, manipulation, 
and a string of disappearances. His association with Marley's Honeykirch in California in 1978 laid the groundwork for a series of chilling events that culminated in the desolate barrels at Bear Brook. Under the pseudonym Bob Evans, Rasmussen dated Denise Bowden, who mysteriously vanished from Manchester, New Hampshire, post-Thanksgiving in 1981, along with her six-month-old daughter. Authorities suspected Rasmussen murdered Bowden in California, although her body was never found. Bowden's disappearance wasn't reported, as her family believed she left due to financial woes. Throughout the early 1980s, Rasmussen assumed custody of Bowden's daughter referred to as Lisa, posing as her father. A series of aliases, charges, and abandonments followed. Curtis Kimball in 1985 faced driving under the influence charges and child endangerment in California. Adopting the guise of Gordon Jensen, he left Lisa at an RV park in Scotts Valley in 1986. Arrested as Gary Mockerman in 1988 for stealing a vehicle, Rasmussen received a three-year sentence for child abandonment. After parole in 1990, he vanished again. Resurfacing in December 1999 as Larry Vanner, Rasmussen married California-based chemist Yoon Soon Joon in an unofficial ceremony in 2001. Tragedy struck when Joon went missing in June 2002. Her body discovered buried in cat litter within their home, a victim of blunt force trauma to the head. Rasmussen's no contest plea in 2003 led to a 15 year to life sentence for June's murder and dismemberment. Born in 1943 in Denver, Colorado, Rasmussen spent his formative years in Arizona and attended high school in Phoenix before enlisting in the U.S. Navy in 1967. Marrying in 1969, he had four children, residing in Phoenix and later Redwood, California. His family recounted instances of his physical abuse, leading to his wife leaving him in 1975, following an aggravated assault arrest. Their last sighting of Rasmussen was around December 1975 or 1976, accompanied by an unidentified woman. Traversing the United States, he often worked as an electrician for oil and gas companies. And in New Hampshire, he was employed at the Wyombeck Mill. His New Hampshire period witnessed three arrests in 1980 for writing a bad check, theft, and diverting electric current. Records show a woman named Elizabeth Evans as his wife during his time in New Hampshire, possibly the adult victim Marley's Honeychurch found in the Bear Brook Barrel. Rasmussen's demise in prison in 2010 at age 67 left a chilling uncertainty, a question mark hanging over potential further victims. His presence during several New Hampshire disappearances and ongoing investigations connecting him to California murders added to the suspicions surrounding him. In the midst of Rasmussen's dark history, the story of the unidentified child lingered, an echo resonating through his disturbing past. A child robbed of identity, yearning to reclaim her name from the chilling depths of an unsolved mystery a beacon of hope amidst the surrounding darkness. If you possess any information leading to the identification of this young girl, the last unidentified victim found in the Bear Brook Barrels, please contact the New Hampshire State Police at 603-223-3856. This unknown child deserves to be granted her long-awaited identity. On a crisp morning on the 22nd of May in 2015, Portland, Maine was shaken by a somber discovery that would baffle investigators for years to come. It all began when a passerby, wandering along the picturesque shore near Fort Allen Park in the city's east end, stumbled upon the lifeless body of a woman in the tranquil waters. She was an Asian woman just five feet, one inch tall, and a mere 99 pounds. She was estimated to be between 30 and 50 years old, with brown straight hair cascading down to a 12 inch ponytail, held by a black butterfly hair clip. Her brown eyes held secrets that she would never share, 
and her ears were pierced as if she once adorned herself with beautiful earrings. The most potentially identifying detail, a slightly curved, well-heeled horizontal scar about six inches long adorned her lower abdomen. It hinted at a past, a story that only she knew, but one that could provide a vital clue to her identity. In addition to the mystery shrouding her past, her eyebrows were cosmetically tattooed, suggesting a meticulous nature or perhaps an artistic soul. Her clothing, though simple, was peculiar. She was dressed in turquoise jeans and layered in a short-sleeved turquoise shirt, a white long-sleeved shirt, and a white zip-up sweatshirt adorned with the word bride on the back in white rhinestones. A jean jacket, nude-colored lace thong, and nude knee-high tights completed her ensemble. The mystery deepened as the investigation uncovered the belongings she carried with her. She had $500 in her possession. Adorning her fingers, wrist, and ears were pieces of jewelry, a yellow metal quartz watch with white stones around the face, white metal bird dangle earrings, and a yellow metal flower ring with a cluster of white stones at its heart. The day before her discovery, she had been alive. And yet, she had met an unfortunate end, her identity vanishing with her. Her cause of death has not been disclosed. Help us identify the mysterious woman found near 4th Street. She may have been a mother, a daughter, a sister, or a friend, and she deserves to be known. If you have any information that could lead to her identification, please contact the Portland Police Department at 2078-748479. Together, let's unveil the shroud of mystery that surrounds her and bring her the justice and recognition she deserves.